Thank you. I'm going to invite uh, my panelists to get on the stage uh, so that we can get going. Thank you all for being here. And we look forward to an interesting discussion on the issue of urbanization. The key topics that we'll be addressing are issues that are not often addressed in these fora. You know, they concern concepts such as equity. How do you, when a society urbanizes many more older people, many more poor people, how do you address their needs? This is something that we heard yesterday also as a prerogative or a priority for this, this government. And we hope to understand how technology systems and proper thinking can address that. And second, how do you address the issue of agency? Agency refers to the greater desire of people to have more control over their lives and less control by government. How do you look at technology and systems to address these issues? So with that preliminary background, let me move over here and I'm going to start our panel discussion in a moment. So my, uh, I'm first going to call on Manoj Kohli. Manoj is the executive chairman of SoftBank's Energy Group. SoftBank you must have already heard of. Uh, they're the guys banging at the back, is that right? Okay. Uh, so SoftBank Energy Group, you know, a big investor in, obviously in the field of energy, I've asked him to go first and give us a perspective over the next two to three minutes, looking at the transportation and energy components of, uh, of, an, uh, of a future urbanization system and any other thoughts he, thoughts he may have. Manoj? Well, thank you. Uh, I think we are going through a massive transformation of energy sector and transport sector across the world. Uh, in the last 20 years, I went through a mobile internet transformation uh, and I led it for building a company which has 400 million customers. And now I'll be, my company is involved in these two big transformations of energy and transportation. Uh, yesterday we saw data which said that the urban population will grow from 40-45% to about 65% in the next decade or so, which is so true, which means urban areas will have much more population than rural areas. And the, and the population in rural areas actually is much more scattered and not concentrated and intense as urban areas are. So clearly urban areas need a new solution, a new solution in terms of smooth energy and smooth transportation, but also clean. Very important to make it clean because if you see 80 to 90 percent of pollution across the world, whether you go to Beijing or Delhi or other polluted country, uh, cities of the world, 80 to 90 percent comes from power plants which are thermal and vehicles which are petrol or diesel. And these are the two sectors, hence, need massive transformation. Clean and affordable power, clean and affordable vehicles which are clean, which are non-polluting. So, uh, luckily India has launched a project for, for 100 smart cities. And already details of about 60 of them have been finalized. And these smart cities are taking this, these two major transformations into account. Uh, recently, I was in uh, Riyadh and, and uh, Saudi government has launched NEOM, which is the huge project of a new city from ground zero. And we have been, SoftBank has been involved as advisor to that project. And we are helping the government and helping the NEOM city uh, team on building uh, clean energy, through solar, through storage, and of course through wind, uh, because we believe that uh, a combination of solar for daytime, wind for night, and storage, which is becoming more affordable, can be fantastic for a new city, which is 100 percent to be served by renewables. Number two, all vehicles being electric vehicles, which will have lithium-ion batteries, and we are starting with this concept that how uh, whether it is, it is uh, electric buses, electric cars, etc., that cities start with that. And, and, and in the older cities, we convert them as fast as possible. Uh, I think this will be a huge transformation 
of both the transport and energy sector, which has to be catalyzed by governments, catalyzed by industry. Uh, and, 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 and we have to do it faster because another 20% population, which globally will be about 1.5 billion population, will move from rural to urban. And if we don't do it fast, I think this population will be in quite a sad situation in the urban area. So I think that is what the exigency is and that is what the opportunity is for companies like SoftBank, GE and other mm -hmm. large companies of the world. Good, thank you, Manu. That's an excellent setting of the stage. I do have a question for you before we move to the other panelists. You know, the, if you, you talked about the Indian program f for 100 smart cities, right? Um, now, if you look at India's experience with urbanization, it's been a poor one. Today, over 50% of the population in most Indian cities still lives in slums. What gives you confidence that things will change? Is it a difference in government? Is it a difference in technology? Is it a difference in approaches? No, three reasons give me confidence. Number one, I'm optimistic. I, I'm optimistic guy. Okay. I don't think we can look at future with pessimism. Number two, the government of India now, the new government of India which took over three years back is very, very purposeful, is very focused and uh, is decisive. I think it's very different from past governments and this government is really a fantastic model of political leadership in the world. And that's why Indian leadership, new leadership is uh, one of the top two, three leaderships of the world today in terms of strong direction, strong execution focus, et cetera, et cetera. Number three is what you rightly said, technology. That's a huge shift. I don't think we had technologies of internet. I don't think we had technologies of transportation, electric vehicles. I don't think we had transport affordable technologies of solar and wind till about five, ten years back. So with all these technologies moving to our advantage, to, by our I mean the advantage of the masses. Uh, for example, on, on smartphones, India has 400 million smartphones and it'll, it'll, have, it'll grow to 800 million in the in, in next uh, 10 years. Now, this is fantastic technology uh, breakthrough because 800 million people can access data. And of course, the 200 million who are left, another 300 million who are left, will have feature phones which will have good data. So I think technology is a fantastic plus which we have. Good. I mean, I'm an economist, so I'm not naturally optimistic. Um, and so I would say that, you know, you go to the slums of Mumbai and you see people using smartphones, but they're still living in the slums. So let's move to, but I think that's a good segue to what public policy can try and achieve. So I'm going to now turn to Jerome Pecres. Jerome is the president and CEO of GE Renewable Energy. And he has some very interesting ideas on how renewable energy will change the way we think about energy and the role of the government to manage conflicts and issues that may arise. Jerome? Thank you. So, I mean, it's fair to say that when we look at the energy world, we see a pace of disruption that is accelerating, and we see three major disruptions. I mean, one is more electrification, as you said, with electrical vehicles. The second is more decentralization, with more localized self-production of energy. And the third one is the drive towards renewable energy. And this applies at the utility scales. It's also applied at the city level. And that's what I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. And in particular, when you look at renewable, the trends towards more renewable energy, what we have seen over the years is we have seen an accelerating again recently is a drive with technology and scale, which allows renewable energies, both wind and solar, to be cost competitive with fossil fuels in most regions of the world. That's one. Second, when we see now how these various sources of renewable penetrate into the network and how they can complement each other and add storage, we see a potential when we talk with our utility customers to guarantee to them 100% base load, renewable energy, at a cost which will be better than the fossil fuels. And that we can accommodate via storage, via hybridizing wind, solar, and using hydro in the places that make sense, and building a system that is optimized with electronics on one side and software and digital on the other side. So this world of energy is moving again towards 100% competitive base load renewable. It's true at utility scale, it becoming true at the scale of large cities. I mean, when you see projects 
like the one you mentioned, like Neom. Neom wants to work with 100% renewable. In Europe, Barcelona recently announced that they are building a municipal utilities, which is going over time to supply Barcelona electricity needs with 100% renewable. So what was a fiction even five years ago is now becoming a reality. It's, it's, it's being managed via technology. It's being managed via regulation. And we, I mean, as much as we no longer need subsidies, we still need some regulations I mean, to get rid of fossil fuels and make sure that we have the instrument in place to optimize the whole system. And it's going to, at the, at the, at the city scale level, to be achieved via smart networks. I mean, we have a way that is going to bring the whole thing together, both the consumption side at the large scale at the decentralized level, I mean, combining what we can do with 100, 2 megawatt f f fuel plants and what people can do by aggregating the local demand at the retail scale. So we are going to pull that demand together, optimize that demand with production and make sure that the smart networks are going to improve in the way the, the system at the city level is going to work. So I think that's what we see coming again, a huge transformation at the utility scale, progressively filtering down to the city and the urban level, and probably at a scale which is going to be faster than what we expect, with some continued support by regulation, by this support moving to, I would say, bring to the, the old type of support what subsidies across the board. The new type of support at the regulatory level is going to be smooth facilitation of the change. Great. Uh, do my fellow panelists have any queries for Jerome? Uh, or we can move on. Those are very innovative ideas. Uh, thank you. So let me, let's move on now to, um, uh, to I'm going to invite uh, Professor Katsuhiko Hirose. Hirose-san is uh, you know, a strategic planning uh, head for future technology for Toyota and comes with many, many years of experience, first as an, a physicist and an engineer and now a, a planner for his company. And the issue that uh, he's going to talk to us about is, is transportation. Not surprising, but transportation, but from a, from a perspective that you, I, I think you will find very interesting. I'm not going to presage his comments, except to say that it's going to address some of these issues that I raised in the beginning, that of those of agency and equity. Hirose-san. Okay, thank you very much for introduction. So I have been working for one third of my company life as a planner and two thirds as an engineer. But uh, what I've learned from the planner or strategist, if you make a decision by prediction, it will fail. So, <laughs> so you can prepare for the future, but you cannot predict the future. That I've learned. So, uh, 20 years ago, I initiated uh, electrification of the car with the police development. Then those time, if say the all the car has a, will have a motor uh, to assist or to uh, say, propel the car, everybody laughed. So, and after 10 years, still the people said, so, oh, there will be a diesel or there will be a lot of the other technologies. The only few years that the people say, oh, the future will be a battery electric vehicle. But this is something I have some objections because of the, the, the society will be uh, the much complex, or can I say the uh, future will be definitely the much more renewables and minimum use of fossil fuel. That, that you need to optimize the whole the energy and transport. So transport cannot be separated from the energies. So the, of course, if you have a lot of the renewables, you need a energy storage. And the battery is, as you know, the very low energy density storage. So the, either in other uh, long range storage system is necessary, either hydrogen or chemical or any other, because of the, you know, the fossil fuel has been stored the energy for millions of years, uh, from the electron, uh, photons to uh, convert into the, 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 the hydrocarbons. So uh, we need those storage. So we see the future will be a combination of the electricity and hydrogen. 
that is not just for the transport. That will be uh, the key feature for decarbonized society because the hydrogen can be used from the very cheap electricity to the variable uh, fuels, not just for the transport, but for the uh, feedstock of the chemical industry or, uh, of course, heating the factory or this with low carbon. So I think that the people missing the real physics of the economy. <laughs> So the, the, you need to, the, the previous uh, speaker talked about the value creation. And what missing is that renewable energy will be very cheap. If you convert it into some of the variable, you can create a value. That is a very interesting way to thinking about. Mm -hmm. From this concept that uh, I have a discussion with Adunok and the Aramco, about the renewable energy combating the hydrogen could create a very interesting value chain in the energy side. So that is very interesting. And also the final very important thing is that transport is the choice of the customer. So people are choosing the car not because of that is clean or this, or even the cheap, because of the, we have a customer from cheap, the preferred customer to the Lexus in the, the gorgeous car. So the people choose their transport by their choice. But that is very, uh, and a little bit different with the economists. The economists always say uh, society move to the minimum cost. But that cannot explain the transport, explaining the car from the Yaris to the Lexus. So I think, but that is the key to change the world uh, drastically, and even we can accelerate the transition of the, uh, low, uh, the towards the low carbon sustainable society uh, more than we expected before. <coughs> I would like to uh, thank you, Hirose san. I would like to raise uh, a question about who will use what. When you talk about convenience versus efficiency, you have different populations within a city, so you have the elderly for whom you know, they need customized services, as you yourself were pointing out to me earlier. And then you have this whole question of are public transportation vehicles more efficient than mm. private transportation. So what's the future going to look like in these respects? I think that that's a bit similar to the smart ones. Is, uh, transport can be uh, characterized more precisely for what the people want. So, Oh, I misunderstood, I break my leg. Then actually, the, when you have a trouble for your leg, climbing the steps is easier, but descending the, so the, most of the big cities uh, building, you have ascending uh, the uh, elevator. Escalator. But, escalator, but not descending. But if you really think about the future, uh, the population, you have more elderly and disabled, you need the door-to-door -door transport. That, that, because people want the freedom to move. So I think the, I think the very good combination of the, those door-to-door -door, uh, mobility and public transport and the car sharing or uh, autonomous driving, that will be a future, that future will be more specific, uh, characteristically uh, precisely uh, designed transport. Mm. So let me take this question to Manoj. Yeah. I want to ask him from a data expert's point of view. You know, I, I had a conversation with the head of automobile uh, driverless technologies for Hyundai recently, and he said that in a connected system, he, they estimate that each car will be generating about 25 gigabytes of data per hour. And you can imagine millions of cars trying to connect with each other as cars, buses, and so on. Let me ask Manoj, what's the challenge there? Is it doable? Or does that seem daunting? I mean, how many years are we talking to address this issue? Uh, I'll give him a yeah. chance to say. Yeah. Uh, Manoj? OK. Uh, Professor Hirose san yeah. yeah. OK, that, that's another challenge. But at the same time, as I talked, that the good example is that you can understand what's going on more precisely from those data, but navigation system. 
that uh, pointed out the shortest cut from your house to somewhere. But actually, everybody rushing to the same road, that creates another congestion. So, yes. so data collection is a very good way to understand the situation, but solution can be different. So you need more idea to solve this. So it raises the issue of whether the public policy goal should be managing traffic congestion or providing convenience. And I yeah. think something that the automobile industry and, and all have to think about a lot in the years ahead. Yeah. But with that, I think it raises an issue of efficiency that I'd like to turn to our, our next panelist, um, and uh, that is Jasim Hussein Tabet. Uh, Jasim is the, the CEO of Tabrid, which is a district cooling-focused company. And he has uh, offered to provide his thoughts on how this particular technology can address uh, the needs of large populations. Jasim? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so uh, when it comes to uh, planning for, for your energy consumption, it's very important that you, uh, you understand your base, where, where we are now and what's our consumption patterns. And uh, we're fortunate now, it, maybe it's January, the weather's out, uh, nice outside, uh, but the majority of the time uh, in this part of the world, in the, in the UE and the GCC, uh, cooling is, is, is required. And, uh, and it's a big component of the, of, the, of the energy mix, of the energy demand in, in this part of the world. Um, it is 70% uh, uh, of the peak power requirements during, during summer. And, it's, uh, and cooling represents, cooling spaces represents 50% uh, of, uh, of the overall average uh, consumption. So it's a big, big part in, the, in this part of the world. Um, and, um, and there are different technologies out there. And uh, when, when, when speaking about uh, future, future cities, uh, 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 we're always talking about district energy. And, and one of the components of the district energy is district cooling. And, and the basic idea is there, you have economies of, of scale, you have a centralized cooling plant uh, pumping water to, to, to a cluster, to, to, uh, to a future city. Uh, and the, the biggest benefits of, uh, of that, it is uh, substantially uh, more efficient. It is 50% more efficient than, than the standard, standard cooling. And that's the number one thing we're looking at when it, when it comes to sustainability, is first focus on your on your, on your efficiency and, and, and your own demand. Uh, uh, we have uh, 72 plants across, across the GCC, and, uh, and we have a, uh, we've seen that we were able to, to save the governments or, or our customers over one and a half billion kilowatt hours every year. And, and that's, that's significant, uh, and that represents uh, with that, the, the power plants are, are consuming less natural gas, they're, they're producing less, less uh, NOx or, or CO2 or so forth, and uh, we've, we've contributed uh, uh, reducing 700,000 tons of, of cooling. Uh, uh, so it's, it's very important that, that, we, that, we, that we have and think about this district cooling when it comes to planning the future needs uh, in, in this part of the world. and and. Uh, and there are other benefits, not only the energy savings. Um, uh, it, it opens up the space, it is, it is more reliable, uh, it is it's a bigger scale, you benefit from, from, from shifting the load. Not all, all buildings in, in a certain cluster or, or in a certain development will need cooling at that time, so, so you don't o overbuild and so forth. And we're seeing, we're seeing a big shift in, in, uh, in the UAE and the GCC and where we operate, that governments are, are, are coming and, and approaching uh, cooling providers and, 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 uh, and asking, if I do connect to a district cooling system or, uh, or a district energy system, how much do I save? How much do I contribute to, to CO2 reductions? How much do I save dirham-wise on, on, my, on, my, on my monthly bill? Um, but never again, I mean, uh, there are challenges, and, and how can we improve in, in the energy planning is, uh, is we need to increase the penetration of uh, of district cooling uh, and, and, and needs to be uh, needs to be man mandated. Again, with with, t with any infrastructure uh, projects, you always have have the challenge of of timing, uh, laying down the infrastructure, and then waiting for the demand for, for the for the city to come up. So that's a challenge that we have to overcome, and uh, and sizing and scope and so forth. 
uh, and, uh, and educating, educating uh, 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 customers. And, uh, and there's a big, we are seeing the big, the big shift, and especially this part of the world, there's, there's, there's been a, a shift from removing subsidies uh, in terms of power and water, and, uh, and that just really emphasized the need of efficient uh, energy solutions. Thank you. Uh, Jerome, do you have any perspective from your view as a re you know, promoting renewable energy in terms of addressing any policy conflicts you see with district cooling? I think, I mean, in, again, in the old days to promote renewable, we needed feed tariff to be able to, to be competitive. I think with the evolution of technology and with the scale of that market now, where we, are, we operate in a world where every year renewable is probably now 60% at least of the new energy capacity which is installed and growing. Uh, we operate in a world where wind and solar are probably at grid parity in half of the world and we'll get to grid parity by 2020 is much more than that. So I think we no longer need tariff. I think we still need in some places some penalty on CO2 emissions to continue to push governments to respect their Paris targets. We need a stable regulatory regime so that people know that when they finance a project or when a project wins an auction, that project will happen in the condition it was planned to happen. So I think we need a stable re regulatory regime which drives this world of auctions to, certain, to certainty of executions. And we need governments more and more to think about the combined integrated system meaning how do grid operators collaborate together in places like Europe? How do we do more connection of networks to make sure that renewable energy flows from one place to another? And how do we secure an environment where funding of renewable projects, which is in theory available, is in practice guaranteed and cheap? So I think moving from guaranteeing tariff to facilitating the long-term growth of renewable energy mm -hmm. via a stable regulatory and financing regime. That's how I say it. I don't know if you have a different yeah. perspective. And That's a great to, point, yeah. Trying to make sure that we, we see more a world now where projects are awarded via auctions. So the cheapest project wins, which is an element driving down the cost of renewable energy. It's a good thing. At some point of time, the government needs to think about how do I regulate the auctions to make sure that it's not necessarily only the cheapest project that win, but the one that are execution certainty and brings local content where local content is required. So still managing a bit this auction system to make sure it does not work to the extreme. Because sometimes the cheapest project is not going to be the one which gets executed. Great, that, that's a good response. So we have now uh, a few minutes for questions from the audience. And I'm going to Welcome that, you know, I know that not many sessions have had time for this, but we do have about a few minutes left. So I'm going to encourage the audience to put up their hands and ask questions. Don't all raise your hands at once. There's one there. I see one at the back there. Yes, please, go ahead. Please, yes, here. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. I'm... Uh, the chairman of the American Renewable Energy Institute. And um, my question is, um, how close do you, do you gentlemen think that we are to finding a, a price point on carbon? Will that be something along the Paris model, the Paris Agreement, uh, a voluntary perhaps uh, price point, maybe led by China, I don't know. Um, but I think in order to really drive everything that you're saying as quickly as we need to in the face of accelerating climate change, that it um, uh, will be necessary to have some sort of a global carbon tax, perhaps voluntary. I'd like you to respond to that, please. So great question. Your question is, how close are we to finding a price point that will bring some stability to a regulatory regime, right? That 196 nations can agree to, yes. I think Jerome, can we just, can you just repeat the question? I didn't so how understand. close are we to finding a price point for carbon with the idea that once you have one, then at least you can take it from there in terms of regulation, pricing, investment, and so on? 
I think uh, Jerome, okay, this is I definitely think, one for I you think, as well. Yeah, sorry? Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think we are moving. I mean, there is no fixed price point, firstly. It's a dynamic price point, country to country. And we are moving faster than we expected towards the price point. I believe, as uh, my friend here said, that grid parity is more than 50 percent of the world. It will be much more in the next two, three years. Uh, I believe that price points which are coming in the next three to five years will be lower than our expectations, as they have been lower than our expectations in the last five years. Second thing, I also believe the point which, again, my friend made about renewables base load is a new concept and I think it's something which is very surprising to our thermal friends. Uh, and if that happens, that will happen if the storage gets much more affordable and which storage will get very affordable in the next three years, three or four years again. And then the price points will fall further for a 24 by 7 power, not for intermittent power, but 24 by 7 power. So I believe finally the price points actually will fall faster than your expectation and my expectation. It will be dynamic, it will be faster, it will be actually serious responsibility of governments will be there to have a very clear plan of action on thermal plants, migration, etc., etc. That's very, very important. I'm not seeing across the world a very systematic, orderly transition plan for thermal. Now, there are a lot of thermal plants which are more than 25 years, more than 30 years, which will be transited out where the loans are also zero or close to zero. Now, these two plans, governments have to catalyze, and if government ministers are sitting here, I think I'll make a re special request that they should catalyze. Because the price point will move faster down, that is not a worry. It's clean energy, that is not a worry. What is the worry? Two, number one, that a very smooth, orderly transition plan for thermal plants, wherever the pollution is high. And second, a retraining of workers, which is very retraining of employees, retraining of uh, manpower. And finally, finally, the issue is wherever there are loans to the banks, uh, I think uh, one has to be careful that loans are fully paid back so that there are no NPAs of the banks. Uh, Manoj, so, let so me, let me uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, but, just but, because but of I, time. Yeah. But I think uh, I, I, think I want to push point. back one second, uh, Jerome. Push back a little. I mean, the whole point of his question is, this orderly shutdown or changeover from thermal to renewable requires a price point. Is that what you're going to say, Jerome? Yeah, but I was exactly saying the price point is moving down faster than we expect. No, his point but is it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, let's give Jerome. That's the point, I think. Even in a world where renewable is competitive and new projects happen more and more with renewable rather than with fossil fuels, a price of carbon is needed to force accelerated decommissioning of the existing thermal power capacity. I think that's what you said, and I agree with that. What, what the European experience has showed us is that market-based mechanisms do not necessarily lead to the right price of carbon, because what has been tried, to, tried by the European Union leads to a price of carbon which is no incentive. So it probably means that, I agree with you, we'll get there, and maybe more via the Chinese model rather than the European model, based on experience. Okay, we, we, if there's one more question, we can take it, otherwise we'll... Yes, there's a question there. Yeah, the mic is coming to you, sir. Yes, my name is Ala Bukhari. I'm from... The a little louder, please. Yes, I am from the Electricity and Cogeneration Regulatory Authority from uh, Saudi Arabia. My uh, question regarding... Uh, cities of the future. We, we talk about, uh, for example, uh, 2050. Uh, how can we predict uh, the energy uh, requirement? Now, uh, what we heard that energy is needed, there are going to be congestions, uh, renewable energy, and so forth. But did we factor in the effect of technology on the cultural change? Now, we heard about uh, education has changed. Work itself will be changed. Now, in cities, there is 
lots of people go in the morning to work and then come back in the afternoon in 2050. Uh, do we expect the same behavior? Technology affect that. So uh, how is that factored in the energy requirement in, in the 2050, for example? I think it's very difficult to predict, but it's important to factor it in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I understood your question, you're asking if we cannot predict people's behavior, how can we predict energy use, right? So how do these interact with each other? Yes, what I'm saying that the cultural change in terms of work and education, we have to factor this in, in the prediction of the future energy. For example, lots of people will not go to work in the morning. They will work at home. They'll use their mm -hmm. technology, uh, education, and there may be no need for physical schools, so to speak, and so forth. So that's important to factor it you in. Factor it into, yes, a very good question. Anyone like to address it from our panelists? I'm, I'm not sure I heard it yeah. perfectly. So. so I think the, 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 he's making the point that in the future, people's work patterns will change, life patterns will change. People may work from home. Point you raised about elderly, you know, their behaviors, their increasing population. So when this happens, and how do you use these uncertainties? How do you manage them to come up with predictions about energy use and type? Once we are responsible for provides mobility or transport, so what I've learned is, you know, that the future is very uncertain. So. Uh, that is not a single way to go. <laughs> so, but there are some, some, some way because of the people will not spread energy anymore. So the efficiency will be much, much, much more important. Or uh, carbon dioxide, that is the trend, never stop. Or there will be some, some way uh, the trend will not change drastically. Of course, like as I said, so when I was in uh, the first planner in 2003 or 4, uh, I said the oil price can be 40, above $40 per barrel. The hybrid or these can be flourish. But in those time, only $12 per barrel. So my boss said, you're joking. <laughs> so, so, and all, only a few years later, the oil was uh, above $100 per barrel. So, we cannot predict the future, but as a planner or a strategist, you can follow some of the unchanging trends. Then, uh, if you reach certain points, then you, you have to be flexible. So, if you fix the trend and you spend all the the uh, effort to do this, that is uh, the trouble. So you need to have a portfolio of concentrating some of the new technology, some of the rest, but if you, you go to the next step, you can, you watch the future and the world, then you modify, you have to be very flexible to modify your strategy. That, that is approach, what yeah. I can say. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll have to wrap up here because of time constraints. But thank you, panelists, for a lovely conversation. And may I ask you to give them a round of applause? And I'm really happy to be